Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we are going to talk about bipolar disorder. Uh, it is a very important and prevalent kind of disorder. It seems to affect 2 to 2.4% of the population worldwide. It is the sixth leading cause of disability worldwide. It seems to affect both men and women in pretty similar uh, ratios. There are a lot of life issues that go along with this. There um, is a greater incidence of self-harm through substances and uh, other kinds of behavioral activities. There is uh, an incidence of suicide that is greater than in a typical population. People with this disorder can have uh, a great deal of anxiety, substance abuse, personality issues, migraines, obesity, diabetes, um, the list goes on and on. So from a Jungian point of view, as well as from a biological point of view, uh, we are going to engage this important, difficult, and still not at all well understood disorder. And before we jump into our topic, I want to let listeners know that you can support us on Patreon. Go to our website and uh, click on podcast and you'll see a place to go to our Patreon page. We produce many episodes every week in which we answer a question from a patron, discuss a topic or interpret the dream of a patron. So if you're dying to get your dream discussed by the three of us, becoming a patron increases your chances. And uh, we have a lot of fun uh, making that extra content. So uh, every week we post a, a, another kind of 10 to 15 minute episode. So hope that you'll check that out and think about supporting us. We really do appreciate it. So all of us working in this mental health field have come across and it all ascends with an, an array of struggles and various difficulties. One of the most challenging things that we come across is bipolar disorder in as much as it is so resistant to normal therapeutic interventions. There is something so deep and foundational in both the psychic structure and even perhaps in the way that the brain functions, that it can be quite difficult to use simply talk therapy to move into a more integrated place. But I have had that happen on occasion, that the swing between the mania and the depression turns out to be in certain people more of an archetypal wound, an archetypal problem. So one way that we might frame that is that the manic experience seems to be connected to the energy of the puer, and the depressive experience could be typified by Saturn or Kronos, and the swinging between the two suggests a lack of integration between these various opposites. So um, I don't know, maybe we can talk about the, the puer in its most difficult aspects and, and how that might be connected to mania. You really highlight an important dynamic uh, in this disorder, which is alternating between puer and senex, or high and low, or up and down, uh, rather than integrating them. 
And uh, integration uh, is what we hope for, really, for everyone. We could call it individuation. Uh, and a great visual image of integration, of course, would be the yin-yang symbol. Uh, both retain their distinctive qualities. Each has a little of the other. They are in harmony and, uh, and comprise a united whole versus uh, swinging back and forth, as you said, Joseph. Right. So bipolar disorder used to be known as manic depressive disorder. And that calls up this fact that people suffering from bipolar often alternate sometimes rapidly between states where they're absolutely euphoric and uh, maybe grandiose, or as we would say, inflated, and then feel kind of crushing despair at other times. So if we imagine some of the qualities of Hermes or Mercury, there's uh, this very youthful dynamism. There is a sense that the mind can move with stunning rapidity from one idea to the next idea, from one person to the next person. Mercury never fatigues, never needs to rest. Some people in a manic episode or many report that they don't sleep for many days um, sequentially. That's often the first uh, sign of alarm that I note. If someone says that they've had trouble sleeping, I ask them, what does that really mean and how long has it been going on? I have a kind of rule of thumb that if somebody hasn't slept for about two to four days, then we're going to move into crisis mode that just sleep deprivation can trigger a psychotic state. So that lack of need for sleep, and then there's a rapidity of speech. Again, the, the mercurial soaring of words back and forth, and there can be a feeling of secret messages even. People in manic states may be driving down the highway and believe that the, the next 10 license plates that they see uh, if they can suddenly decode and feel that there is a profound message that's being told to them that feels kind of life-changingly important. They sometimes can uh, become promiscuous in a manic episode and they'll have an affair or they'll have a sexual encounter and then maybe a, an hour later they'll find another opportunity for a sexual encounter, much like Mercury, who uh, you know famously would race around and have these sexual conquests, which is why um, in the ancient world, you know, the crossroads were all marked by Mercury, who was the god of travelers, but it always had a small, uncircumcised erection carved right into the middle of the pillar, because uh, Hermes was always kind of ready to go with that much dynamic energy. So that hypersexual behavior is also part of mania. And then, of course, there's sobering stories of Puer's getting into a lot of trouble. I'd like to add that in addition to this sort of euphoric mood, there can also be a highly irritable mood, a restlessness, can't, can't sit still. And that even in a kind of euphoric state, uh, it is, uh, from my experience, obvious to any observer that this person is not really happy. Yeah, there is, um, in that state, there is a profound lack of relatedness, that the, uh, the ideas are so um, electric that they consume all of the libido in the psyche. And so how other people are perceiving us in that state is, is just kind of absence, or the repercussions of our actions are meaningless, much like the story of Icarus. Icarus was the son of Daedalus, who was the Greek mythological master craftsman. Daedalus built the famous labyrinth in which the Minotaur was housed and took on a number of other uh, wonderful magical prospects, but wound up, along with his son, uh, being jailed in a high tower by King Minos of Crete. And in order to escape, Daedalus fashioned for himself and his son uh, some special wings. 
and they had feathers glued onto these wings by wax. And so as the wings were completed and they prepared to make their escape, Daedalus told his son Icarus that he could not fly too high or the sun would melt the wax of his wings and he would fall. But neither could he fly too low for the moisture and wetness of the water would cause everything to become sodden and uh, weigh him down and once again he would fall. And, of course, Icarus, as the young man, uh, Puer, lit off from the tower, and he did fly too high. He was so thrilled with his newfound ability to fly that he crashed. And it's a wonderful mythological image for what this particular disorder can be like. Yeah, I I think we're in the realm, as I said earlier, of inflation, and grandiosity is one of the uh, kind of hallmark symptoms of a manic episode. So someone comes in, and they're going to start a company, or they're going to write a book, or they've got big ideas, and uh, they're they're very um, certain of their capacity to uh, live these out. There's no real uh, kind of reflection about the reality principle. They're just certain that they can overcome any obstacles. And of course, we, we think of that in Jungian terms as inflation, which is connected with this idea about becoming identified with the archetypes. So one of the ways that I think about uh, bipolar disorder and mania in particular is that we we are identified with the gods, and it's as if when we're in that state, we are living in the realm of the gods. We think everything is possible. Everything is suffused with this intense meaning. We uh, have sort of spiritually surpassed the normal bounds of what it means to be human. And of course, that's not possible. We're not gods. And so eventually, we, we have a often bruising coming down to earth. But it is so wonderful and magical, in a sense, to be in that inflated state. I mean, I appreciate what you're saying, Deb, that mania is not happiness, and there's often irritability that goes along with it. And there can be something infectious and and wonderful about someone who is in a little bit of that state. I'm thinking of Robin Williams, who uh, had bipolar disorder, and I think in some ways exemplifies the golden side of it, if you will. When, when, he was, when he was sort of up and on, you know, he was just electric. And of course, that informed his really um, appealing and infectious performances. I, I also, I also want to talk about uh, how this can be a kind of spectrum disorder, I mean, Deb, I think you put it right out there at the beginning that this is one of the this is one of the DSM diagnoses that has the strongest case for it being really biologically based. Yes. And uh, you know, Joseph, I, I appreciated what you said too about uh, th- there there does seem to be a psychological and even archetypal element, and I I would agree with that. And you know, this is maybe more so than some of the others, this is really this is really in your genes. There's a significant hereditary component. But I also see in my own experience that some people have it to the extent where they're really incapacitated. They have difficulty functioning. They're constantly having to get their medication fiddled with. They may spend time in and out of hospitals. And other people seem to have just a little bit of it. And that can be tragic as well. I'm not saying those people uh, only get the upside of it, but you know it's not a coincidence. I think that there are an extraordinary number of very uh, successful, brilliant people, especially in the entertainment field, who suffer from bipolar disorder. And it's because I think that the mania is a little bit like being kissed by the gods, and it comes with a curse as well. J. Redfield Jameson uh, has written a number of books on bipolar disorder, and I will list not all the books, but I will list her, and you can look up all the books on online. And uh, one of them is um, Touched by Fire, Manic Depressive Illness and the Artistic Temperament. 
Hmm. So that there, there is um, a tendency for people with this disorder to be drawn to poetry and music and acting and a whole list of, of other artistic ways of expressing, expressing oneself. And, and uh, I like that title. And what, what it makes me think of is that, you know, these are people like Robin Williams, for example, where their fire burns very brightly. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm not wanting to romanticize it, but I'm just aware of this element as well. I uh, know someone in my personal life who comes from a family of uh, several siblings, and a, a couple of the siblings have bipolar disorder to the extent where they're, they really can't function. Uh, you know, it's, it's very sad, but their lives have really been blighted by this. But my friend, I think, has sort of just a little flavor of it. And he tends mostly to be very up and have a lot of energy. And he's the kind of person that, you know, when you spend the weekend with him, he's up at 530 going, great, what are we going to do today? (laughs) And he's always got big ideas and tons of energy and big schemes. And he, he can go to dark places. But but mostly he just has this incredible energy. Uh, that mm-hmm. I think has really fueled his incredible success in corporate America. I think the world is run by people who are chronically hypomanic, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> which is different than full-blown mania. Hypo yes. means a yes. bit less than. Mm-hmm. So when we're, when we're shy of the true possession by the gods, um, these are people who really can work uh, 18 hours a day at something they love and do it brilliantly and feel revived with a short amount of sleep and do it the next day. And there is a place for people that are just blessed with whatever that is, which yet often comes at a price. My fantasy is that if we think about this from an evolutionary perspective, a little bit of this confers something really wonderful and um, there's another book by uh, K. Redfield Jameson called Exuberance, The Passion for Life. And somebody like Teddy Roosevelt is a great example of this. He was always in motion. He did all kinds of things, you know, whether you agree with the decisions that he made or not. Um, he had that passion for life. So I think your point about there's a spectrum and some of this infuses a culture, families, uh, communities with some zest and spark, and too much like fire can can burn. So hypomania can lead to exhaustion, injury of the body by overworking, overtraining. Um, it can leave the subtle emotional dimensions of relationship and intimacy unexplored because there's so much energy to, mm-hmm. to move so quickly. And yet, as we said, you know, Steve Jobs looks like somebody who probably was hypomanic. This is purely speculative and accounted for this fierce capacity to work and create an empire. And famously at the end of his life, when he was dying uh, of cancer, he was telling people that he, he was grieving the loss of relationship and family and intimacy. And those parts of life, that require gentle and slow tending. So, yes, it brings us gifts, and yes, it costs us um, great things, terrible things. So, one of the tasks in treating a bipolar disorder, working with it, is to help the person go more slowly. The old saying about making haste slowly. Uh, really applies here. How to slow it down a a little bit so that the person isn't always going 85 miles an hour. Sometimes medication, uh, especially if it is at the, you know, burning more hotly end of the spectrum, medication is important. So is helping the person to cultivate, you know, sort of healthy lifestyle habits, a sleep regimen, a sensible diet that, of course, includes some fun foods. Really watch it with substances of all kinds, alcohol, drugs, whatever else. 
and psychotherapy because that ties into the relationship part you were just talking about with Steve Jobs, uh, someone that the person trusts who can be supportive, containing, directive, and help to um, establish an objective point of view and an observing ego so that the person develops the capacity to say, whoa, ah, um, I was going way too fast yesterday. I stayed up way too late late last night. You know, I need to get back on track. A couple things come up for me, Deb, on on what you were saying. First of all, I want to jump in on this idea about kind of uh, regulating sleep and eating and that kind of thing. Uh, I've worked with people who maybe were a little hypomanic, and one of them in particular, I'm I'm uh, recalling that it, it was so important for this person to make sure that he slept a lot. He learned that he just needed a lot, a lot of sleep. And he also tended to uh, need to just make sure he ate well, I mean, and and ate a lot. And that was very grounding for him to just, you know, eat, eat a nice good, healthy, big meal and uh, go to bed early. And he figured out how to kind of work work in a nap and also exercising. This person did a lot of yoga. And I think that these things really helped him keep his feet on the ground. He was really aware that these things were really important and that uh, switching up any one of those things would make him vulnerable to uh, becoming a bit untethered. Working this metaphor of the Puer and Mercury Hermes and the remarkable speed reminds me a little bit also of Mercury poisoning. And we could even say that um, there's a correlate, that the signs of a manic episode are surprisingly similar to Mercury poisoning, Mercury being one of the elements, natural elements in the world and stuff you see in your thermometer, etc. So mercury poisoning also has that effect of sweeping people into a hyper-aroused kind of sweating state. There's tachycardia, the heart is beating very, very quickly, the brain is firing too quickly. And we get this term uh, from the 1700s, 1800s, mad as a hatter. And in Alice in Wonderland, there's a mad hatter. But this actually was a medical problem because the creation of those felt hats and other objects, millinery work that hatters would do, involved mixing liquid mercury with various fibers and other things to create effects. And as the mercury volatilized and was inhaled, or penetrated through the skin, this metal poisoning would build up in the body and create these um, terrible conditions, one of which being a, a chronic mania. One modern example of this, which is so extraordinarily demonstrated, was um, captured in a podcast. It's uh, available online at S Town Podcast. Dot org, S-T-O-W-N-P-O-D-C-A-S-T dot org. And the S stands for shit town. Um, that the main character who is chronically manic in the episode called um, an NPR producer and relayed that he was investigating a, a, a terrible murderous cover-up in this small southern town that he lived in And there was something about the intensity of his voicemail and the follow-up phone calls that the producer had with this person that compelled them to want to go and investigate and record and take a look at some of these things. And what they found was this rather extraordinary man who was profoundly uncontained and, and wild in a fashion who begins to unfold a story unfold his life, and the producer slowly begins to put together a story that no one in the town seems to have noticed. And towards the end, this gentleman, I believe, commits suicide. His mental state is intolerable to him. And it turns out that he was 
repairing clocks and replating some of the metal objects, gold plating them. And when one does that in a non-laboratory environment, as he was doing, he would take large amounts of mercury, dissolve a bit of gold in it, and even with his hands, just washing metal parts in these tubs of mercury. No one in the town had speculated he was experiencing um, metal poisoning, but the reporter puts this together in a way that is just heartbreaking because you really, you come to care for this fellow. He's funny and brilliant and eccentric and strange and trying to survive in this state that he's in. And tragically, the inability to recognize what was happening did cost his life. But it's, it's a lived example of this congruence between the archetype, its poisonous affect, the quite literal physical problem of it, and the general energy field of a manic episode and the burdens of people who, who frequently cycle in manic episodes. I just also want to add in terms of clinically, there's something called bipolar one and bipolar two. And the differentiation and the distinction is some people have a tendency towards a predominance of manic episodes and fewer, and sometimes rarely depressive episodes. Some people tend to be on the depressive pole with few manic episodes and the predominance of one over the other is seems clinically significant, particularly in terms of medication choices. So some people are marked by mercury in a way that curses them and perhaps at times blesses them. Joseph, I find it really remarkable what you've come up with about the consonance between the archetype of mercury, the substance mercury, and and its effect on our on our psyche, just at a biological level. And, uh, you know, I guess I suppose the correlate would be, what does lead poisoning do? Lead is associated with Saturn, and that's the more kind of depressive archetype. And of course, my understanding of lead poisoning is that it does uh, really depress the central nervous system, I, I think. I mean, I, I, I know people can become kind of catatonic with lead exposure. Right. They can become constipated, which is another that kind of locking up and things won't move. Fatigued, they lose their sex drive. Um, they can become irritable. They don't want to eat. They can lose certain um, capacities uh, to manipulate objects even. And that same description could be used to describe somebody who's in a severe depressive episode. That There seems to be a congruent energy field uh, just to let everybody know, I'm not suggesting people who are suffer from depression or literally have lead poisoning, but in this Jungian world of metaphor, you know, to be poisoned by Kronos or Saturn, to be lead poisoned as an extraordinary archetypal metaphor, does does seem to have a correlate, and we associate Kronos with the kind of slow, plodding, sequencing of, of life, where there is too much coagulation. Things, things are getting so thick, and people will say this, that like getting their foot out of the bed onto the floor is like moving through peanut butter. We've often had those dreams, right, where you're running to get away from something that's disturbing you and all of a sudden your arms can't move. It's like the spirit of Saturn is just landed in the dream and is thickening everything and making it very, very slow. And the effect that that has on someone's life can be you know, just devastating. People who've never been in a major depressive episode sometimes have a hard time imagining this, but I, uh, when I was in my 20s, I didn't even know what was happening, but I had a single major depressive episode after I graduated from college. Literally, I would wake up in the morning and I, I 
could not find the energy to move the blanket off of me. I actually needed mercury, so to speak, and mercury is often associated with the conscious mind, that I have to talk to myself and say, pick up my hand, take the blanket, move it three inches, pivot my body, put a foot on the floor. I literally had to narrate my body as if I was made of wood. Mm -hmm. Luckily, whatever was going on with me, by the time I could get into the shower and had some kind of stimulus, I could get in motion and go to work. And But it was, uh, it was a, an extraordinary capture in the spirit of Saturn and the agony of that, that it was emotionally painful. And I had no insight into why it had happened. I can speculate now but it really felt like my body had been hijacked by something. And Jung might have said, yes, uh, you've been a puer most of your life here, and here you are at uh, 25, and you are going to have a visitation by Saturn and Kronos. And boy, it was a visitation. <laughs> so you've really um, illustrated generously, I may say, you know, what it is like to be uh, in the depressive pole of of a bipolar disorder, although yours was unipolar, as we uh, say in in the trade, as it were, and that the manic part, the manic polarity, can be just as intense and just as excruciating in its own way. And the person that has this disorder is is sort of suspended or ricocheting between these two extremes. The goal is, like Icarus, to find, to find the middle way. The lifestyle component of a therapeutic regimen cannot be overemphasized. And having a relationship with a therapist where there is trust and caring and support for staying on medication, there's a tripartite kind of lens that can be a huge relief and very helpful to helping the person stop alternating between this soaring search for, for transcendent, spiritual, exalted experience, um, which is compensated for by um, extreme lifestyle, sleeplessness, overeating, overindulging, and other sort of uh, concrete or, if you will, profane uh, kinds of activities. Uh, this is a state of real suffering that is predominantly genetic. And if we could just take a look at it as a, a disorder that has a lot of biology that's not well understood, but a lot of biology going for it, uh, it might help us be more patient and more compassionate and more generous uh, to the treatment of people, many of whom, if they are at the extreme end of this, uh, really cannot live independently, hold jobs, take care of themselves well, and deserve a kind of containing care that they often don't get. Often people are captured in a healthcare system more often if they are manic, because they're often acting in ways that capture people's attention. When I was working in the inpatient uh, psychiatric hospital, those were two uh, common events that somebody would have been captured by the mental health system through police assistance to bring somebody in who is in a very severe manic episode. And... Conversely, if somebody was suicidal, they wouldn't be brought in unless they declared a suicidal uh, plan and ideation. So the, it's, a, it's a different kind of extreme that could bring them into uh, intensive care. In the manic state, when people return to their more balanced consciousness, and in that environment, it's, it is really is through... Uh, medical intervention, so we're injecting them with geodon to calm them down and also just get them to sleep 
but the sleep deprivation is makes it almost impossible for the ego to function after a while. And, and by the way, this is often advice <laughs> that I give people is if people are prone to mania, I will ask them to meticulously track how many hours they're sleeping. And as soon as they are sleeping less than five hours a night to see, go to their um, physician and just get a sleep aid. I've absolutely, and I still have clients who've been able to forestall manic episodes because they will force their brains to sleep when they their brains won't normally do it. And that keeps ego function intact. It also keeps them in relationship to the unconscious because they're dreaming. And when somebody is awake for days as well as burning the brain out from exhaustion, they're deprived of the corrective effect of the dream. I appreciate what you've both been saying about uh, the biology of it, and I'm uh, fully on that page. But I, I want to just go for another second to this, uh, the archetypal aspect of it that you've been lifting up, Joseph. And to say, you know, if it is a spectrum disorder, and I think it is, then we're all somewhere on the spectrum. And there's a way that all of our lives are touched a little bit by Saturn, and all of our lives are touched at times by Mercury. And I'm aware also that our culture is perhaps a kind of manic culture, at least aspects of it. It's cert we certainly live in a culture that rewards hypomania. I'm thinking of corporate America, um, the tech sector, I mean, the, the, the faster and uh, more light-footed you are, the better you do in these fields. The, the, the big visions that the tech geniuses have, these kind of spring from the creative fields of Mercury, I think, in some sense. And I think it's good for us to know this. I mean, Mercury is, after all, the god of technology. The technology that we're using to record this erases limitation. We can instantaneously be with each other, even though we don't live in the same place. So in some sense, we are living in a profoundly kind of manic culture right now. And that might be important for us to know because we might have to uh, cultivate an opportunity to spend some time with Saturn. In relation to this, I also want to bring up this wonderful psychoanalytic term that uh, is just so evocative for me, as many of these terms are. We speak sometimes about the manic defense. And I think that many of us spend a lot of time in the manic defense uh, manic defense does not mean that you are manic. It certainly doesn't mean that you have bipolar disorder, but it does mean that you escape from uncomfortable feelings by uh, kind of compulsively doing something, by busily cleaning the house or raucously going out and dancing uh, or, or just getting very, very busy with work, perhaps, that there is a kind of driven quality to our doing and we can ask ourselves, against what am I defending by doing this? So in the manic defense of the Kleinian piece, what is the telos of the manic defense in terms of their understanding of that? Well, I mean, I, I think that a defense is, is always an effort to avoid some unpleasant part of reality, whether it's psychic reality or outer reality. I suppose that Jung would take that a step further and say that, you know, the neurotic suffering, there's always kind of a kernel of wisdom in it, or that the symptoms are always the psyche's best ability, at a, best, best uh, effort at a cure. So in that sense, Joseph, I wonder if you're saying, you know, when we find ourselves in the manic defense, where is the wisdom in that little bit of mania that's showing up in our lives? You know, what we're, you know, looking at over and over again is um, a kind of compensatory effort that we all make. Uh, when we're down, we try to do something that will bring us back up. You know, maybe we, we engage in some kind of huge project to take our mind off the thing that we don't even want to recognize. Now, we, we all do that. 
uh, or we've engaged in something and we're just exhausted and wiped out um, after a big effort or a deadline, and we just say, well, I've just got to crash for a week. So these are alternating states. And it is different in degree, but perhaps not so different in kind from what happens in bipolar disorder, except that it's more severe and it's dysfunctional. And what we want for ourselves and for everyone is, first of all, equilibrium of how to balance the ups and downs. But later, we want insight. We want a synthesis. We want a symbol-making function so that these ups, downs, opposites can come into relation with one another like, like the yin-yang. But, but job one is to achieve a kind of equilibrium, a basic lifestyle with medication and psychotherapy equilibrium. And that is true for all of us to balance the opposites. So if we think about that, what that might look like in a very um, lived moment, when somebody is in a manic episode, they often feel omnipotent, which I think, Lisa, you were talking about with the Kleinian construct of it. I'm thinking about uh, an uh, an older woman that was in one of the wards that I was working on, and she had come in, her medication was restored, and her rationale uh, came back to her. And one of the experiences people often have when they recover from a severe manic episode is the restoration of Eros. They remember that they are in relationship to other people and they have affected them often quite negatively. And that's followed by a sense of grief. And grief is that dose of Kronos, that dose of lead that needs to come into the soul to put them back in their feet. And this particular woman in a, in a exuberant extended manic episode had spent her daughter's entire dowry. And when she was returned to herself, when she was left in that Saturnine grieving and heartache place and having to now negotiate this situation with the daughter whom she seemed to really sincerely love. But this is the, the cost when, when the gods take us over, so to speak. Their agenda and our human agenda don't often mix well. And I'll share a quote. Uh, this is uh, from the Collected Works 13, paragraph 55, and I'm just taking the last bit of it. It is not a matter of indifference whether one calls something a mania or a god. To serve a mania is detestable and undignified, but to serve a god is full of meaning and promise because it is an act of submission to a higher invisible and spiritual being. This personification enables us to see the relative reality of the autonomous system and not only makes its assimilation possible, but also depotentiates the demonic forces of life. When the god is not acknowledged, egomania develops, and out of this mania comes sickness. So, if we say that perhaps, you know, Hermes, Mercury, any of the Puer Puella gods are repressed, that we don't have a sense of the inner autonomy of these images, we don't have a way to personify them, is what Jung is saying, a way to imagine them. Reading mythology was something Jung encouraged as a curative intervention because it gives us these conceptual frames to place certain qualities outside of the ego and into the collective unconscious where it should reside instead of inside of us. And that, I'm not saying that that would cure bipolar disorder necessarily, 
but it is one of the ways that Jung was trying to address the costly behaviors that any of us are vulnerable to when these forces take us over. And I love that quote, Joseph, because it really brings up the spiritual side of this disease, which Deb, you've alluded to, <laughs> that there, there is a hunger for transcendence. And, and again, that is very human, and it can take on these really even kind of dangerous proportions when someone is suffering from bipolar disorder, the desire for transcendence. And when we're manic, the belief that we can achieve that uh, perhaps through uh, really not so well advised means. I'm one of my, uh, I don't want to, I don't know if that's right to say my favorite, but one of the most compelling portraits I've seen of someone with bipolar disorder is this Werner Herzog uh, documentary called Grizzly Man. And uh, it profiles this young man, uh, Timothy Treadwell, who uh, becomes just entranced with grizzly bears. And he kind of knights himself, he dubs himself the protector of the grizzlies in this just vast tract of wilderness in Alaska. And he goes to live with the grizzlies. And there, there's this, this is incredible footage of him, you know, swimming in a river bare chested with this grizzly bear and, you know, reaching over and touching the grizzly bear and the grizzly bear kind of, you know, irritably snaps. But Treadwell felt, you know, the bears are my friends. He, it's, it's, a, it's a, just a remarkable watch because talk about inflation to think that you could, you know, kind of romp with the grizzly, that you, you, were, you were on that level. There's a, there's a point in the film where uh, Herzog speaks with um, a, a native uh, museum director there, and he makes the point that, you know, his culture has always lived alongside the grizzly bears and has afforded them a great deal of reverence and distance that we have to have a right relationship with the unconscious. Mm -hmm. We have to understand that it is more powerful than our egos, and we have to have a reverence for it, but we also have to kind of give it wide berth. We can't become identified with these forces mm -hmm. in the unconscious, which is what Treadwell did. And, you know, you can imagine his demise, and it is exactly what you would expect. And it's very uh, tastefully handled in, in the documentary, but um, he does not survive. That is a, a really powerful and so on point example of what mania can look like. And I've seen the film, and of course, um, he's there by himself in the, in the wilderness. He is untethered from relationship with other human beings, with culture, with society, with, with things that might help him stay a bit more grounded, which takes me back to the myth of Icarus. And I wonder what it would have been like if his father, Daedalus, had said, stay right next to me or follow me, follow right behind me. We are going to do this together and uh, stick with me rather than simply giving him directions. Because relationship as part of our common humanity is especially important in you know all kinds of mental health disorders, but especially I think in bipolar disorder, because people long so for the transcendence, they long to be received, they long to be understood. I would like to add here that as uh, we considered this topic, and I did some more reading and note taking, and through this podcast, I wondered if I would really want to share uh, what has been with me all along, which is that my mother had bipolar disorder and other family have it. And I'm newly moved by how powerful this, this is, how important it is, and how incredibly human and poignant this can be, and what one hell of a struggle it can be to stay in relationship with somebody who has bipolar disorder. 
This takes us really right to the roots of our our hearts, our minds, our persistence, our determination to really accompany with discipline and compassion and patience and most of all persistence somebody who has this disorder. I think you're you're bringing in a a discussion which I think we often don't have as I'm realizing on the podcast is the effect of some of these events on the children of such people. Um, we talk about all kinds of archetypes and human experiences within the intrapsychic environment, but there is a whole other social dimension that has a powerful, powerful impact. And I appreciate you bringing that up for further conversation between us. And, of course, I will add that my mother suffered. She had a difficult life, and she was a remarkable, vibrant, passionate, talented human being, and I loved her very much. It's all there in a particularly demanding, intense, uh, multicolored mix. I can feel what you're saying, Deb, and, and wanting to honor your mother's strength and integrity in that she, like all who suffer extraordinary states, was a human being, that she was a soul in relationship to her children and her family, even though these um, extraordinary archetypal storms affected her. I'd like to take just a minute to deepen our discussion about the depressive side. We've talked about creative depression before, which was, I think, very helpful for many people to understand that sometimes the drawing of the life force into the underworld actually is in service to a rebirth experience. And, and sometimes it's not. So, I wanted to unpack just a bit more of the mythology of Kronos. Kronos and Saturn uh, in different systems are, are connected. So Kronos was the son of Uranus, and his mother was alarmed by Uranus's relationship to his son. And she convinced Kronos to castrate his father and the phallus is thrown into the ocean and that has a whole other storyline about what that does but i want us to look at this symbolic connection between intense depressive states and castration that if uranus is the primal self the original matrix and something has happened so there is a kind of insurrection in the deep deep part of the psyche and the creative fertilizing aspect of the self has been cut off and thrown into the ocean thrown into the unconscious that lack of fertilizing access has an effect on the psyche and so it's no mistake that Cronus was associated with with lead and slowness and even deadness. As the myth continues, Kronos marries, produces the first Olympians, and he is so afraid that they will do to him what he did to his father, that he eats them. Zeus's mother's help, they trick Kronos into not eating Zeus. He's able to get the children out of Kronos' belly, and the Olympians are this next stage of dynamic life, and Kronos is cast into the underworld where he lives in Tartarus, which was this particularly disturbing, kind of hellish kind of world. But this image of Kronos as the castrating force and Kronos that eats all dynamic potential 
and just stuffs it inside. I think is an extraordinarily powerful and instructive symbolic way of understanding that kind of depression and how how life is really um, captured and dissociated. So perhaps we can wrap up by just appreciating the Jungian contribution to the conversation that in most modern treatment paradigms, the view is that the brain is broken, so to say, and there are these mechanical things that can be done. The, we try this medication and that medication, or in, in older times they would uh, do convulsive electroshock therapy, and, but the focus was very much on the machine of the brain, and we still have much of that attitude, and there is some truth in that because we do have some science that suggests the neurochemistry of the brain becomes problematic and that changes uh, how it functions. So again, no disrespect to the interventions that save people that happen in, in pharmacopoeia. I think we're adding that simultaneously the soul, the psyche, is also contending with these powerful archetypal forces that interfere with the ego's relationship to the self, as Debut said with the transcendent function, that something interferes with the symbol-making function in the psyche, because symbols capture force and distance them from the ego, so there can be inner objects that are related to and not forces that possess the ego and even disruptions to sleep can have some violating influence on this ego self access and one of the Jungian correctives is to be able to find mythologic metaphors to describe the states of consciousness so that once again the ego can have distance from these powerful energies, and it's in the distance that people can then restore themselves to their reasonable, life-affirming behaviors. So we hope that in this episode, we've touched on that and piqued some curiosity about this additional way of considering bipolar disorder. So before we switch to a dream, I just want to take this opportunity to let you all know about Dream School. Dream School is our online program that teaches you how to work with your dreams. Uh, There are audio components. There are 12 of them. There are 12 different topics. It should last you about a year to go through them all one by one. And we, we really walk you through the entire Jungian approach to working with your own dreams, which can be a really powerful way of, of shifting things and uh, working with the wisdom that is an aspect of the unconscious. So that we hope you'll go to our website, thisjungianlife.com, and check out Dream School and consider joining. Today's dream comes from a 32-year-old male artist, and here's his dream. I'm in a restaurant, busy with people standing and moving around. I too am standing and have been given a seafood dish in an opaque glass. At first, like a fancy stemmed glass for cocktail shrimp, and I slurp some of it down. Looking into the vessel, I realize I've been eating raw seahorses. I continue to eat one and then another, not wanting to be rude. They're slimy, room temperature, and gray. I look again into the vessel, which now is narrow at the top and wide at the bottom, as if the seahorses, barely submerged in a gray liquid, are in a dark pit that I have to peer into, and I do realize that some of them are still moving, puckering their lips, trying to breathe. 
I decide I cannot keep eating them. I go to where murky puddles have formed in the cement by the melting ice and crab parts of the kitchen's seafood prep. I assume the puddles to be brackish, or at least can provide a more bearable end of life for the seahorses, so I throw them in by flicking the glass. There are still more seahorses stuck to the bottom of the glass, my flicking hindered by its strange shape. People are standing and talking around the puddles now, so it's discreetly that I quickly flick the rest of the seahorses out, not wanting to be seen doing it, and not wanting the seahorses to be seen in the puddles. He adds as context, The past several months have been marked by a lot of depression and isolation, loneliness, and as a result I've been feeling pretty insecure about my social world. I'm about to go live in Italy for a couple of months, which is very exciting, but also, because in fact I won't know anyone there, is in a sense a big step backwards from feeling stable and in a community. He says his main feelings in the dream are mild disgust, sadness, empathy for the seahorses, and a kind of social discomfort or embarrassment. And then he adds a little bit about his associations. I did not feel like I had any close companions or familiar friends in the dream. It was sort of like a fancy dinner I was only at incidentally and at a location I did not recognize nor was particularly distinct. In fact, I'm not sure I noticed any walls at all, just many people. I have been living in Brooklyn, the land of restaurants and vague social anxieties, so that could be related. In terms of seahorses, they are not something I've dreamt about before that I can remember, and not an animal I have much particular experience with. That being said, it's only this past summer that I learned you can find seahorses washed up on the ocean beach. I have a dried seahorse now from a city beach, and I keep it in an oyster shell in my bedroom. Well, I I find this dream so poignant, actually. Uh, I mean, just a a couple of things that jump out at me is, uh, you know, he's in this this sort of land of... um, social persona. He's at this fancy dinner with this kind of cocktail glass. By the way, I just love that he calls Brooklyn the land of restaurants and vague social <laughs> vague social anxieties. It's so perfect. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um yeah, I can really feel that. So um but anyway, so he's in this kind of persona land and then suddenly there's this awareness of something. And as he pays more attention to it, it be it goes from being inanimate to alive, barely alive, but alive. So what I sort of imagine about that is that seahorses image some aspect of inner unconscious life that has been inadequately attended to and perhaps has been used as kind of a, in a callous way as a sort of resource. You know, it's just being served at this, in this fancy cocktail dish. But when he begins to pay attention to it, you know, he doesn't even notice that they're alive until he pays attention. So it's that sense of when we begin to tend the unconscious, it comes alive. I really appreciate it. I, I have to say, I, I just have this sense of, um, I think I'd like this dreamer. You know, I, I love his sort of ethical stance of I, when I realize they're alive, I cannot eat them. Like he can't do this. He can't continue to treat this content as uh, as just this sort of uh, soulless resource. You know that this is something important, and he doesn't have the wherewithal to really um, make it completely better. But he is interested in trying to give them the best end, at least that he can. And the end of it with the puddles, and he's kind of embarrassed. There's a self consciousness. To me, that's like the feeling of being slightly embarrassed that we're attending to soul, you know, that maybe all of our friends are going to go out and they're going to go drinking or something. And, you know, we, we realize that, uh, I don't know, that, that what, what, we, what we really need to do is uh, stay in that night and journal about the dream we had the previous night. You know, it's a little embarrassing. 
you know, who's going to understand that or value it? That's that's him, you know, trying to do the, the best he can with the seahorses in these kind of brackish, disgusting puddles, but but also not not wanting anyone to see him. There's a there's a kind of sense of embarrassment about it. So I'll 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 just stop there for right now. But. I I think I'm very much. Um in a place similar to where you are, Lisa, especially the part about Brooklyn being the land of restaurants and uh, vague social anxieties, having lived in Brooklyn for almost uh, 20 years. But, you know, the dream starts with, um, you know, this sort of preciousness about the restaurants <laughs> of and it's in you know all kinds of magazines of special dishes and what kinds of exotic things can we eat and all kinds of wonderful ethnic foods and the new restaurant that opened up on Smith Street that you can't even get a reservation for for at least three months. So there's this sort of elevated uh, uh, aspect that where culture has almost become you know uh, sort of rococo and overly done and overly ornate. And uh, the seafood dish is being served in a special glass, uh, like a glass for cocktail shrimp. So there's such a discrepancy between all this sort of persona aspect of restaurant and foodies and culture and what turns out to have life. And he's, he starts out by slurping some of it down, but they're raw, and they're in, they're slimy and room temperature and gray. And they're in a gray liquid in a dark pit that he has to peer into. This is not something that can be, you know, that one would serve in a fancy restaurant. So in a way, there's a kind of bipolarity here between the presentation of we're all at the wonderful restaurant and the actual reality, which is uh, this is not even appetizing from the get-go, uh, and as you said, his then deepening appreciation for there is life here. And isn't that the way the unconscious often presents itself to us, is not as, you know, sort of multicolored, uh, lovely little fairy lights twinkling in the evening, but as something slimy and dark, room temperature, not all that appealing, but alive. And then we have, of course, the image of the seahorse, which we all checked our uh, symbol dictionaries <laughs> and could found could find nothing. And yet, of course, seahorses are really such magical little creatures. Yes. They really do look like horses. And horses are often an image of just the life force itself. And so it's the life force that inhabits the ocean of the unconscious in mm -hmm. some sense. So this is, uh, this is a pretty special thing to find, I think. I, I think what's interesting about seahorses is that they're small and they're very odd little creatures. They're not dolphins. They're not uh, you know anything grand and grandiose, but they are charming and childlike. Every child loves seahorses uh, because they're the life force in a quirky, manageable, understandable kind of presentation. I find the dream um, slightly confusing, <laughs> honestly. Uh, and I would really want the person here to, to move in uh, a little bit more. I find myself having a, a f body reaction to eating something that's uh, ostensibly disgusting, although he doesn't use that word. In the moment, he doesn't uh, later on, but I certainly uh, recoil. I, re I remember once um, going to a really fancy restaurant and, you know, as always, I get myself in trouble by wanting to try something new. Um, mm -hmm. And so there was just a little bit of uh, pasta and it was covered in squid ink and some other kinds of things. No, no offense to those uh, gourmands among you, but it, it was like eating rotten fish bait. I mean, it was horrendous. <laughs> and, and and I'm forcing myself to eat it, you know, like because someone's decided it's a delicacy, 
and I don't want to embarrass myself. And so I'm like, <laughs> like chewing and not breathing to get this kind of this stuff down. And then finally I hear somebody several seats back talking to the waiter really angrily saying, this is totally disgusting. Like I cannot imagine you would charge anybody money for this. And I was such a relief to have somebody just say the truth about it. <laughs> But it begs that question, which I really find curious in the dream and I find curious in myself is, why why did I keep eating it? That even the smell of it was, my body was saying, this is horrendous. And so there is um, this interesting tension between uh, the kind of the authentic body response and then the, the persona and the social milieu and status and this weird way that the culture can declare something a delicacy. Oh, it's a delicacy to eat live seahorses. Mm -hmm. It's a delicacy to eat something vomited out mm -hmm. of a squid onto a plate, you know, <laughs> that's rare. So it must, you know, let's all, let's all take a mouthful of that. Uh, and there's a certain uh, cultural perversity Mm -hmm. about assigning value uh, to quote-unquote delicacies that then, like, trick us. We have to override our natural instincts to participate in this bizarre fantasy in the culture of, of eating or doing something that our bodies are like, oh, my God, well, I <laughs> guess I should. <laughs> and I just wonder about that dynamic, you know, that, that seems to be highlighted for this fellow and that uh, I wish that I had honored. I did not get ill from it, thank goodness, but I wish I had just kind of honored my body and that disgust is a powerful feedback process between primal instincts and what's happening. So where is he overriding so something, some deep knowledge about what's truly valuable. Mm -hmm. He's forced to swallow, mm -hmm. you know, which is a term we use in the uh, culture all the time. I just had to swallow it and move on. Suck it up. Suck it up. I'm going to uh, what he says in the context um, that parallels so much of the of the dream of that the past several months have been marked by a lot of depression and isolation, loneliness. As a result, feeling pretty insecure about my social world. And then he's going to go to Italy in a couple of months, which is very exciting, but I won't know anyone there. So is it a big step backwards? And he doesn't have a community. So, you know, here is, you know, sort of the outer world situation of he's not, you know, all that happy in, in Brooklyn, uh, the land of restaurants and vague social anxieties. Um, he's going to go to Italy, which is exciting, but also, you know, will be lonely when he doesn't know anyone, at least at first, of really trying to go back and forth between those two feelings, just like he did in the restaurant, that he's been given this dish, which is supposed to be something special, uh, and his body experience uh, of revulsion. And so I think we're seeing two polarities here played out in the dream, and and he's living it in his waking life world. So he has this outer world situation where he's looking for more connection and community, mm -hmm. and the dream is an invitation to invest more in the inner world. It also suggesting right along those lines that he's out in the middle of this kind of party, and he's somehow contextually pressured to digest something that's disgusting. So I'm wondering if there's also something going on in the back of the head, back of the mind, that leaving the isolation and, and returning to communal life, to the community, will force him to have to eat something, digest something that he does not want to. And I have to say that many folks that I've had as analysands who are profound introverts, often do find that if they're forced to extrovert too much, they're forced to socialize too much, 
it's like something's being crammed down their throat that makes them feel unwell, and they start getting very resistant. So I'm wondering if the dream is also talking about some price that the psyche at the moment feels it has to pay in order to be part of of the social scene. I agree with that, and I'm putting it together with what you said, Lisa. Uh, It's an invitation to the inner world. It's not as if this conundrum is about, should I stay here or go to Italy? Will it be this or will it be that? Do I have to conform to be part of a community, which at least I have in Brooklyn, versus be isolated and lonely in Italy? It's not about any of those. It's about where are your own inner seahorses that are slimy at room temperature, gray, and need to be tended to, need to be cared for in a way that uh, beyond just throwing them into the brackish water behind the restaurant. The last thing I want to lean into, which is going to be rather Freudian, is that Chinese medicine assigns, as it does to many things, certain medicinal properties. And seahorses are dried and ground up and made into different preparations to treat erectile dysfunction and lack of energy. So there's somehow archetypally, I suppose, connected to that. So sometimes with a dream, I'll step out of the narrative and just circle certain phrases. Gray liquid, slimy, discreetly flicking, not want to be seen doing it. That sounds like masturbation. It sounds like sex, to be honest. So there is a possibility that Part of the loneliness um, that one experiences, of course, as a 32-year-old fellow, there's a lot of natural sexual tension. And the dream, I think, is also brings up a conversation around the ambivalence around masturbation and what that symbolizes for him. Because in the gray liquid are these tiny living creatures called sperm to flick them into a puddle or down a toilet or a shower drain or whatever happens to them. Somehow the psyche is possibly monitoring that. And it's not uncommon. Many of us are raised in cultures where masturbation is a very ambivalent activity, whether it's through religious prohibition and the sin of Onan, as well as many men feel sad after they masturbate, because it is a demonstration that they do not have a partner. And those things can be inexorably linked together. So just another dimension on top of all the other wonderful archetypal and social pieces here to not shy away from, because it feels provocative. You've been listening to This Jungian Life, From our website, thisunionlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this union life.